The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Working with Youth webinar. I am Amber Freeman, the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator with the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. Today, we have a very full webinar for you. But before we begin, I just want to go over some housekeeping. So because this is a webinar, you all are all muted. However, you can type in any questions that you have at any point during the webinar, and we will be sure to get to them. Also, this is being recorded, and the recording as well as the webinar slides will be emailed out to you all, as well as be available in our webinar library. So for today's training, I have um, my colleagues at CCEH joining me. We have Carl Asukanen, who is our Program Manager of Field Mobilization. We also have Diana Barubi, who is our Program Manager of Prevention and Extra Exit Strategies. Myself, Amber Freeman, the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator. Roy Graham, who is our Youth Special Projects Coordinator. We also have our youth intern, Rachel Spears, who is fairly new to our team, but has been doing a great job. And we also have Glory Bowman with us, who is a housing coordinator with Youth Continuum. And we have Kaylin, I hope I say her last name correctly, Sholomisky, sorry, um, who is our CAN Youth Navigator at Mental Health Connecticut. So we have a very full agenda. We are going to talk about youth experiencing homelessness in America as well as Connecticut. We're also going to go over the CAN system and what it means for a youth and how it operates for them. We're going to talk a little bit about coordinated entry, and we're going to hear it from the field. You know, hear Kaylin and, and Lori really talk about being out there working with youth. Um, Diana is going to speak about shelter the virgin and the importance of it. And then we're gonna go into some best practices as far as really working with the youth and, and what's really important to um, provide good services. So we are going to get started with youth experiencing homelessness and I'm gonna ask Carl to kick us off. Awesome, thanks. Thank you, Amber. Um, happy to be here. Uh, this is starting out a lot better than the last webinar. The last webinar I was on, I pressed disconnect for my first action. So I'm gonna just keep riding this momentum here. Um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in. We've been working hard to get this ready for you. So I'm gonna just start with a little context setting uh, for what we're talking about when we say youth homelessness, what are we talking about nationwide? How do we know these things? And then get into just a little bit of the specifics about what we think is happening in Connecticut and where we should be looking uh, if we're interested in really getting a reading of the pulse of how many young people might be unsheltered or experiencing literal homelessness. So really big, just starting with a big picture, looking at uh, point in time count data from 2019, there were 35,000 unaccompanied youth uh, uh, counted as homeless nationwide. Um, uh, out of that number, we know young people in particular, but a lot of um, folks who are uh, homeless are unsheltered, but uh, certainly half the population of young folks during the pit were estimated to be unsheltered or sleeping in a place that wasn't fit for human habitation. The National Alliance to End Homelessness, NAEH, that we've cited here below, is estimating that over the course of the year, approximately 550,000 uh, unaccompanied youth are experience a homelessness episode that's longer than one week, um, which is, that's a really, that's a big number. I would say, too, that there's some data from the National Conference of State Legislatures that also kind of looks at instances of homelessness. So if, if it was 550,000 people that the Alliance estimates or, or young people that the Alliance estimates were uh, homeless for longer than a week, uh, the Conference of Legislatures is estimating during a whole year, there's 
just over 4 million young people nationwide that experience homelessness during the year, and nearly 700,000 of them are unaccompanied homeless youth. So these are instances of homelessness and not um, the entire week that NAEH is, is documenting. So we rely on those partners uh, and the American Community Survey to get some, uh, and the great work that's from Chapin Hall as well, to get some indicators or some sense of what is this problem of youth homelessness nationwide? How do we know this? We're gonna be getting into a little bit of detail later in the presentation about outreach, which kind of uh, addresses this, how do we know what we know um, question. So if I could just hop to that next slide. There's some specific data and some specific work that we've been doing in Connecticut. Um, the five years prior to this, we've been doing a youth outreach and count that happens the same time as the point in time count, which you all know is, uh, or probably most of you might know is, is later in January, like that third week. Um, we did surveys, uh, about 2,600 surveys in 2020, um, statewide through a few hundred community locations over the course of a week. And we surveyed young people from 13 to 24. Uh, and of those, we took those results, we gave them to a demographer at Central Connecticut State University, who's been helping us for years on this. And we, we, he took those numbers and extrapolated and estimated that, uh, based on the numbers from the 2020 youth count here in Connecticut, that 7,823 young people experienced homelessness or housing instability at a point during the year. And I broke, we, he kind of broke that down further for us. So 5,300 were unstably housed, 2,400 or so experienced literal homelessness at some point during the year. And this is just our glimpse um, through surveys, through community members and partner organizations. Um, it's not a total look at the whole of the system. And I kind of want to um, just take a moment and and pause and have you all think about this. If we were really trying to get to the bottom of how many young people are experiencing homelessness, how many, you know, where would we look within our networks and in our partners and collaborators? And uh, how many uh, agencies or organizations, including state partners, do we work with that might be uh, in custody of young people, uh, might have young people getting discharged uh, to instances of homelessness? Like what other programs or areas would we look as a state and as a community if we were concerned in trying to figure this out? So I've listed just a few other things to, to kind of get us thinking in this way about the scope of the problem of youth homelessness. We have great partners at the State Department of Education. Actually, I think I say 2018 and 19, I'm not quite sure. It might be 2017 and 18 was the last time the SDE released these numbers. But every school district reports on how many young people are uh, unsheltered and how many young people are doubled up. So, for instance, let's just look at the State Department of Education uh, in 2018-19 estimated that there were 5,015 youth um, uh, struggling with housing. Um, of that, 3,650 were doubled up. 780 were in shelters, 529 were in motels or hotels, and 53 were unsheltered. So that's, that is data that comes in directly from the State Department of Education. It gives us a glimpse at what school districts are confronted with and also reporting about to uh, the folks at the state level at the Connecticut Department of Education. I just say, too, we would be interested in looking at shelter last month in shelter here in the state of Connecticut, and this is from ctcandata.org. We had 88 youth-headed households in shelter, so that could be a family, and it also could be a single. I didn't make differentiation there, but we had 88 youth uh, in shelter from the first to the last of the month. Um, of course, we, I mentioned this before, but a lot report being unsheltered prior to entry to shelter, right? Not coming up from, not coming from um, doubled up situations. We'd also be really interested, or we would be remiss if we didn't think about all of the young people who may be released from prison on any given month. So if, it's eight, if you're 18 to 24, if you were in prison, if you had a history of homelessness, what happens to you upon release? And what are those numbers like? 
We work closely with DOC, as do many of our partners and collaborators, and through reentry councils statewide. So this is this is vital um, numbers. This, these numbers also speak to racial justice. It's important to pay attention to this um, as a community to focus on. So I don't have that from the last month, but we have been working collaboratively with DOC, and we're trying to really make sure we're charting these numbers closely. Um, also, we have runaway homeless youth providers in the state. There's only a handful of them, and there's not a lot of direct outreach that they do. These would be the providers for minors uh, offering crisis housing, youth continuum, I do believe is here, the bridge um, as well. Um, and I don't have a rye number for the amount of young people that were served in this last month, but again, these are our collaborators. These are our partners within the state of Connecticut. The young people that they're seeing, we should also consider just part of uh, those, right, who are seeking shelter, who are seeking services. We want to know, like, the kind of breadth of the universe. So pay attention to ARRI providers, particularly if they're in your area or if they're offering services in your area. As well, it's important to pay attention to DCF. Enrolling in VCF is, it doesn't mean that a young person is going to be homeless. This is actually a service, right? And, and we try to link young people up with DCF and, and we have partners at DCF statewide. But with that said, the incidence of homelessness for young people involved in foster care, child welfare, not only in the state of Connecticut, but nationwide is nearly 50%. So we have to pay attention to this number. The child and placement number for the month of October, and this is on the DCF website, is 3,982. Um, of course, we'd have to be, we should be interested in looking at who's being discharged each month and where are they going, but I just kind of broke that down for you all to kind of take a peek at, and we're interested in these numbers, right, because when young people are discharged from prison, when they leave high school, when they leave a ride program, or they leave child welfare, um, we don't want them to go into homelessness. We want the hem them to have housing security and stability uh, throughout um, and into the future. So I wanted to just say we think we have an idea and we've scratched the surface of what youth homelessness looks like, but we don't know the totality of it. Um, and this is still me. So what are the causes of homelessness? We're going to talk about many of these things today, and we're going to give evidence to this. Um, we're going to reference uh, toolkits that we've created and, and kind of best practices. But really, uh, one of the main causes and roots of homelessness is family conflict, right? We see this throughout, certainly poverty, housing insecurity, um, uh, previous trauma, youth of color, youth who identify as LGBTQ um, and, and as well uh, that's come through the youth counts previously and we haven't mentioned yet are, are the rates of homelessness for pregnant and parenting youth are, are extremely high as well. It's another um, group and demographic that we want to pay particular attention to. And certainly those youth with involvement with child welfare and juvenile justice. And again, we'll get to some partners and outreach a little bit later on. Um, but it's important to pay attention to our partners at child welfare and uh, through juvenile review boards and, and um, youth serving bureaus. So it's a very kind of big, broad overview. Many of you know this information already. I want you to know that we're worried and we're concerned at CCH at trying to build uh, partnerships and networks with all of the agencies mentioned in that previous slide as well as with contacts at the municipal level to get the best sense possible about how many young people are experiencing homelessness. So um, I think that that might be it for me. Maybe I will, um, yes, my goodness, maybe I will, I, I thank you very much. I wanted to pass this on to my, uh, my coworker um, and colleague, Roy Graham. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, well done. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, presentation. We move on to the next uh, section, which is going to talk about the Coordinated Access Network, or the CAN. As um, we all know it, uh, there are 
seven CAN networks or CAN regions within the state of Connecticut. Uh, I believe when we started out, it was more like, oh, uh, a dozen or more. And then we've since consolidated um, given the needs and, and, and funding streams. So now we're down, we have seven CANs, uh, CAN regions within the state of Connecticut. You can see them color coded here on your screen. Uh, they are broken down Fairfield, Greater New Haven, uh, the Meriden, Middlesex County, Wallingford CAN, or as we call the MMW CAN, Waterbury, Litchfield CAN, which um, I believe uh, now may be referred to as the Northwest um, CAN. We have the Central CAN, uh, Greater Hartford, as well as the Eastern uh, portion of Connecticut, which was Northeast and Southeast, which is now just combined to be one CAN, um, which is the Eastern CAN. Okay, now here's the uh, Connecticut's homeless crisis response system, or as we call it, the flow chart. And uh, if you remove from left to right, we see uh, families or individuals in crisis and how they, if they cannot resolve um, what is the challenges uh, that are happening within their lives and they need extra or more assistance that cannot be resolved outside of the system, they would enter the homeless crisis response system uh, by calling 211 or by uh, through outreach workers. Now, uh, with this presentation today, we're going to be concentrating mostly on the left side of this diagram. Uh, we will have another presentation where we will concentrate on the right side of the of the program. So. Today, uh, what we're going to be focusing on and what you're going to be hearing mostly about is the CAN assessment, the outreach, diversion, um, what happens um, day to day is again, you'll hear from uh, some providers who are in the field on a daily basis. So, and just mind you that um, just because someone has crisis and they may call 211, they may never see the system that 2-1 may be able to resolve whatever crisis they're in. So they may need, never even see the homeless crisis response system, which is exact, which is what we want, right? We don't want people coming into the system. Uh, of course, it's not a, we're not deterring people. It's not a barrier because certainly folk, there are people out there who do absolutely need um, our services, but um, any chances that we can um, have, that we do have to not have people come in and we can find them resources within the community, certainly that's the outcome we would prefer. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to go over the categories of homelessness, and these are the categories that were said by um, Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, and these are the ways that we are able to prioritize and be able to differentiate um, people who come into the system and be able to figure out which services and supports and resources that we can um, refer them to or provide to them in order to stabilize their housing situation. So category one. Category one is absolute literal homelessness. They are staying in a place that is inhabitable. and. Uh, you know, they could be in their car. Um, they can be, you know, especially during the summertime, they can be camping out in the woods. They can be in someone's abandoned garage. They could, I mean, young people or anyone's, uh, but we're speaking about young people today, they could be on someone's porch. And just because they're on someone's porch does not mean that they are housed. It could be their aunt's porch but the aunt will not let them inside the house. The porch is not a place of habitation. This, so this person, this young person is literally homeless. Someone who is in shelter is literally homeless. And as you can see there, uh, the other, the other um, reasons that, that categorize them as literally homeless, um, hotels or motels paid by uh, paid for by charitable organizations or by the federal, state, or local uh, governments, or 
exiting an institution where they resided for 90 days or less. And so category one is our, you know, the, the literal homeless. Category two is the, the, the trickiest one um, also recognized by HUD. And a lot of this is when you're doing the work and I'll have the providers in the field speak to this a little bit more is how you verify someone's uh, crisis situation, uh, especially with young people. It's, it's good during the conversations you have with them to really listen and understand their situation. Sometimes young people do not see themselves as being homeless if they are category two because they're house hopping, they're couch surfing, they're staying with friends, they sleep on the floor, they sleep on the couch, they stay here one night, they stay here for three days, they're with someone else for two weeks. Um, but that is category two, that's an imminent risk of homelessness. So at any, at any point, they could be asked to leave and are at risk of being literally homeless and being on the street or entering shelter. So this is where you're really having a, a really problem solving and really informative discussion with that young person to see exactly what their situation is. Um, maybe there's some resources that you can provide them. Maybe they can, you know, avert the, house hopping and couch surfing by some resources or referrals that you can make during that time that they're bouncing around. Uh, category three is um, homeless, but under other federal statutes, it's not really recognized by HUD. Uh, this is someone who is stably housed. Uh, they have not had a lease or owner ownership interest. Um, so this is a category that we really do not look at because they wouldn't fall under any prioritization within within our system for young people. And category four, which is any individual or family who is fleeing um, or attempting to flee uh, domestic violence or other forms of abuse. And uh, if you encounter any young person who is um, experiencing any sort of domestic violence or abuse, uh, you'd want to try to connect them right away to a domestic violence provider, and um, all of you should have that uh, one eight that one eight hundred number in order to connect them. Uh, um, again, this is something that is as if the young person is willing. You may have someone in front of you who says, "Yes, I am." escape or fleeing domestic violence, but they do not want to speak to anyone. Um, of course, you know, they've, you know, experienced some trauma. Um, they do not want to rehash it, do not want to speak to anyone about it for a number of reasons. So um, at that point, they may not want to speak with someone, but they are still category four, they are homeless and you would treat them as such. And uh, but you can always bring it up again to them because they, while they may not want to speak to someone today or receive DV services today, um, next time you speak to them, they may be ready. So it's always because uh, our CCADV, um, Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, has services and resources for um, people uh, as fleeing and survivors of domestic violence. The um, Youth or Young Adult uh, Coordinated Entry Toolkit is a wonderful resource that uh, connect with us at the coalition have on our website. If you go to our website and you go to Youth Resources, you will see the Young Adult Coordinated Entry Toolkit that you can, has many resources in it. It starts right from how you, when you begin speaking with a young person uh, to referencing uh, referrals and it goes through the CAN assessments and it goes through everything that um, you would need. We are looking at updating the Young Adult Coordinated Entry Toolkit. Uh, it is 
a few years old. And as you all know, things change. Uh, you could just look at the year we've just had with um, the pandemic and how many things have changed. Uh, we also want to make sure that the language in there is um, has equity throughout uh, with the language. And we also want to make sure that all the resources within the toolkit are um, up to date with um, what is currently happening within uh, the state of Connecticut and within your own uh, local communities. However, it is still a resource for all of you to use now while we are up, while we are looking to update it. So again, that is on the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness website, and it's under the tab of Youth Resources. You'll be able to find the toolkit. And um, with that, okay, thank you, Amber. Uh, you will see here that um, it's a resource compiled with various information, supports the coordinated entry staff, and I will let Rachel take it from here. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that, Roy. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about what's actually in the toolkit and specific things that you can find if you're interested in getting more resources or more information on how to proceed. Um, or, you know, what the toolkit entails. So um, the toolkit is basically, it's a guide for helping meeting the needs of youth experiencing homelessness by providing community services. So as Roy mentioned, uh, we do want to update it, but for now it is a really good resource. So what you can expect to find in it are um, a few different steps. So the first one is determining risk service pathways and alternative supports for youth experiencing homelessness. So what that basically means is that when the youth calls in um, to 211, they'll have an initial screening. And so that means a brief assessment for immediate crisis assistance and alternative pathways for different services, such as for domestic violence, for mental health, or if the young person is a veteran. Um, what else you can expect is that they're going to be exploring shelter diversion and other types of assistance that avert the current crisis. And if a young person's housing situation can't be addressed through these different strategies, um, and they are literally homeless or they're 14 days of being homeless, the two-on-one call specialist uh, will create an HMIS profile for them and set up a CAN appointment. Um, and so what you can expect with the CAN appointment and what the toolkit helps outline is basically what, you know, what the process is for that. So um, the CAN assessment is the coordinated access network and the way that they go about it is they use a strength-based trauma-informed approach for talking with the youth and determining what their needs are um, and what services are necessary in the current moment. And this is a really important approach that will be touched on later because a lot of youth have experienced trauma. And so it's really important that we're conscious of that and making sure that we're not asking questions that can either trigger or um, really turn the youth off and make them less engaged in the process or not use the services at all. Um, so this can be further um, improved through active listening, and this will help case managers identify the client's needs and the services that are necessary for them. And this can ultimately help stabilize their living situation and help them find alternative ways of handling the current circumstance. Um, so this could be through, again, the mental health and addiction services, LGBTQ services, um, employment or legal assistance. And so after the CAN appointment, the youth navigator will then try and look for uh, the services that are needed um, for the youth. And then the third part is basically tools you can use. So at the very end of the toolkit, they include a CAN assessment worksheet so that you can see exactly what questions are needed and what you should be asking of the young person you're working with. Um, and it also includes a support map. So the next uh, slide is a sample of different questions that you can ask um, in terms of shelter diversion. 
And so this can help the youth identify if they have any other feasible options or necessary supports, uh, just so we can avoid having them go into the system or go into shelter. And so the next few slides, I'm just gonna be touching on different services that are included in the resource kit. So there's a lot from education, domestic violence, trafficking, uh, developmental disabilities. So these are just a few that I picked. So what I wanna first clarify is that these are not questions you want to directly ask the youth, um, but this is the type of information that is needed to help determine the next steps for the youth and what services they're actually available for. So something that you may wanna ask in order to get that information instead of explicitly asking them these questions um, could be, you know, have you ever been told that you had a mental health diagnosis? Um, and this can help a conversation start and help you get the necessary information you need without prying them open. Uh, the next one is substance use. So a way that you can gain this information is by asking, you know, for instance, are you involved with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services? And I do wanna include that the resources uh, have additional information if you want to know, you know, who you're going to contact after you make that determination, whether they do need those services, um, and so that's included in the slide as well. And for the last one, um, it's have you, you know, it's for DCF. So a way to get this information is to ask the young person that you're working with, you know, have you ever had any involvement with the child welfare uh, system or been in foster care? So again, when we're asking these questions, uh, it's really important to be sensitive and not to directly ask them, but instead develop a relationship where you can kind of extract this information through natural conversation. And um, yeah, just to branch off, uh, Carl's gonna be talking about um, outreach next. Great. Um, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so let's just like shift gears for one moment and, and talk about outreach, which is, uh, I, I just want you all to, you know, pay attention to the resource of outreach and also the practice of doing outreach. There is, I, th I think like the broad comment here is, is there's a lot of emphasis right now at the state level in thinking about outreach comprehensively to make sure that, and also in a coordinated way, so to make sure that efforts to identify and engage people are um, in coordination with the regional CAN, and that are, and that also represent this geographic uh, comprehensiveness where we're not just focusing on a particular city involved in the CAN, like Hartford in Greater Hartford or New Haven in Greater New Haven, but we're also uh, emphasizing all of the towns uh, otherwise involved in the CAN that might not have direct outreach capacity. So just in general, um, the state is shifting gears. We at the coalition are uh, paying attention to these efforts to think about this more collaboratively and comprehensively. And to give you a sense, like there are some backbone organizations uh, that are doing this work now that you might, some of you may work for, or some of you might know in your region um, but there's Columbus House and MMW, Reliance Health in the East is a, is a direct outreach provider, Mental Health Connecticut in the Northwest, Journey Home in Greater Hartford and, and CHR in Greater Hartford, um, Liberty Community Services for those of you from the Greater New Haven area, Pacific House, um, just to name some, those are some backbone uh, agencies providing direct outreach, and these are funded outreach providers, either through new monies from DOH or um, consistent and historical monies that come uh, via the PATH program through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So our goal is, um, is really to expand the network to make sure that you all and that our providers that we work with have like the full breadth of knowledge about those engaged in outreach statewide. So you can lean on these partners, ask questions of these partners, uh, talk to them about places that you might 
be seeing people who are unsheltered, uh, and then also, you know, really enter this, enter into the conversation about the importance of outreach within your coordinated access network to make sure that young people are represented when we're making plans regarding outreach to the entire CAM. Um, are we overlooking young people? Are we not focusing enough on schools? Could we be doing more to outreach with our partners at runaway homeless youth providers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, some natural allies in this work that I think of or that we think of um, are McKinney Vento liaisons. These are the folks who work for school districts, every school district, to make sure that the terrain of access to uh, school, including registration, transportation, books and supplies, et cetera, are, uh, is equal for students, whether they're um, housed or not housed. Um, so McKinney Ventos are really vital. We've got great partners all over the state doing this, like this vital work. And some of um, you may uh, know some of them, but they're they're great to link up with. Um, youth service bureaus, of course, vital spaces, and these are often community places where juvenile review boards are happening. Again, um, this is an ally in the work of identification and referral. And more to come with youth service bureaus as they are taking a point in the new work to really have a structured way to document minors who are experiencing homelessness, the unaccompanied homeless youth. We rely on partners such as community action agencies in the East here. We have the access agency and, and their work. Um, I already mentioned PATH and DEMAS. Those are the proper uh, outreach providers, the funded ones um, that we want you to link up with. Uh, or know about. And then this newer effort that I, I'll just mention and then I'll stop is that we have partnered with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities and with Sustainable CT to create steps that every town can take on a voluntary level to address homelessness in their town. One of those steps is for the town to identify a person who is a contact person for homeless services for the town and to have this person report if there are unsheltered people in the town using a non-HMIS form. Um, we just did PIT uh, this last month, the point in time count, and we had a lot of agencies and a few municipalities use this form. Again, the goal is uh, get partners from all parts of the geography of the state to be providing data to CAN so it makes sense for outreach and then it's known to outreach that's occurring in the CAN. So I want you to just um, please pay attention to and if you have some time to check out the link about My Town Cares, the work that we're doing, we're really asking towns to step up, um, look at themselves and homelessness and housing instability in their town or uh, in their or borough or area and then you know report, report frankly to us and then also be part of the CAN process, right? Um, so outreach is vital and um, more to come about this uh, statewide with partners, but we just want you all to know that uh, there's, not, there's not that many resources at the moment. There's been uh, some coming online in this last month, but uh, more planning and, and more collaboration to come. So um, thank you for paying attention to this component of your work. I think we might have Diana Baruby. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, our providers. And, and I'll just hand it over to Roy Graham. Thanks again, Carl. And uh, welcome again, everybody. And you know, we've uh, we've built you uh, up to this point and gave you all this information. Uh, and it's a lot of information. We talked about outreach and HUD categories and verification and the young adult toolkit and referrals and mental health. and so it's really right now a great opportunity to um, hear from two phenomenal uh, youth providers that you know I work with uh, on a daily basis, and they certainly uh, keep me on task and on my toes. So um, I just want to introduce um, to everyone today Glory Bowman from uh, Youth Continuum and Kaylin Sholamiki from Mental Health Connecticut.
Either of you can start at any time if you want. Okay. Do you want to put the canned slide up? Do you want me to go, Kaylin? Sure. <laughs> Okay, so um, youth usually access um, Youth Navigator by calling 211. Um, they will get an assessment over the phone with the 211 operator, um, and they would um, set up an appointment with the correct provider. So usually for us, it's uh, ages 18 to 24. During the assessment, um, we try to speak with the youth and figure out what they need as far as services and how we can help them either stay in the their current housing situation or um, reach out and get them to do something different like housing. I know, I feel like I'm, I'm an echo. Sorry. So during the during session, they can either be diverted back to their family or other resources like friends or other family members, or they can enter shelter once we verify them as literally homeless. We will call a access tool and get them on, you know, as the PL and help them get placed in the housing. Did that come through clearly? Yes, we heard you, Lori. Sorry, you're muted now. Okay. There we go. Is there any question about going through the CAN system? I don't know if that came out clearly because my I'm having trouble with my computer. Yeah, we heard about the CAN system. Okay. Is there anything else you need to me, me to add? We just want to hear an overview of your, your daily experience of um, working with individuals and having them navigate through the CAN system. Um, maybe when you all do the VIs for that, how you do diversion, just your everyday practices. Anything else? So you you, um, when we do call the client, they are hesitant sometimes to speak about what is actually going on. So during the interviewing process, um, uh, it's usually good to get them to open up and actually figure out exactly what is going on with them, asking them open-ended questions in order for them to start like telling their story about why they have found themselves in need of calling 211 and why right now that they are unstably housed. So usually during the interview, I can kind of figure out what I'm going to do with that client and what resources I will be referring them to or if I'm going to be adding that client to the shelter wait list in order to um, get them into um, crisis housing and work with them while they're in crisis housing either to get their benefits such as some of them um, dealing with severe mental health um, issues, um, PTSD, things like that, helping them get into um, some SSI benefits, food stamps, things like that while they're in crisis housing, um, either matching them to another resource like rapid rehousing while they're here um, in crisis housing, or if they're able to just come in, get a job and maintain on their own, helping them to find an apartment, speaking with landlords, engaging, having the youth go and fill out applications, assisting them with that. And we do right now have a full-time case manager 
that is overseeing the clients in our crisis housing. So she has been a great resource to help the clients navigate through what they need to do um, while they're here. And then on the other end, working with the clients that are still with family, but might be at, like Roy um, said, imminent risk of losing housing, helping them to, again, either get more hours at work, speaking to employers, or just actually having the conversation with their family members to say, listen, we are here, we're supporting um, your relative, your loved one, and while we're working with them to secure another means of housing, are you able to like work with us and help them stay there until we can help them either move on or set up another living situation with another family member or friend? So it is uh, all around trying to get the client to see what resources that they have available, what they can do to help themselves and us helping them navigate through, you know, just even speaking to the landlord and giving them the language to speak to a landlord or going and giving, helping them get the resources to do what they need to do. Because many of them don't know how to engage older adults or to advocate for themselves. Yeah, like Gloria was saying, we get a lot of people, a lot of them will come through, they're scared about going into shelter. In the Northwest, we don't have any youth specific shelters. So, I mean, there have been times, sometimes we'll reach out to see if anyone else has space. Um, but I mean, they're already going through a traumatic experience. So to then go into a shelter where there's a mix of adult males and females and families is sometimes a hard situation for them to bring themselves to. So, you know, finding out what supports they have, you know, utilizing their strengths. You know, we do have the Strive Mediation, which is support to reunite, involve, and value each other. So we can offer that if they're having issues at home between family members, um, just kind of helping them get connected. Um, if they don't have employment, I mean, we've been having a lot of youth coming through. They might have left home quickly or been kicked out that they don't have their documents. So helping them obtain state IDs, getting their social security card, that way they can get employment to help them along with their housing plan to you know, make those connections for them. So I wanted to add something to like there, once they are like literally um, verified as homeless and you know the verification could be um, done in several different ways through outreach or they are accessing the warming center, food pantries, things like that, or you can see that the client um, is literally living out of their vehicle and you have somebody verify that. There is a, a tool that we use for youth called the Next Steps tool, and that places them on the by name list at the end of the, um, you can see it at the end. And that is if they, we have any housing programs available um, to match them to such as rapid rehousing, then they would be in that program for a year with a case manager that would do monthly check-ins with them and help them navigate through, um, you know, finance their finances and learning how to um, budget and eventually get off that program and be able to sustain housing on their own. Great, thank you both so much. It's very different with us, you know, being able to, to speak on this, but you all actually do the work. So thank you so much for adding that perspective um, to it. We are going to continue on. And as we are saying that we want to, um, we're focusing on the CAN system, but one thing that we really want to emphasize is shelter diversion. So we have our in-house shelter diversion specialist um, manager to cover all of that, Diana Baruti. Thanks, Amber. I'm here to talk to you about um, a little more in-depth, the practice of shelter diversion, why it's important and why it's effective. So the, the practice of shelter diversion really prevents um, and ends homelessness. It's really a strategy that captures people at the front door of homelessness. So as my colleague Roy had presented on the HUD definitions of homelessness, we're really 
focusing on the distinction between HUD category two and three of homelessness in that piece of imminent homelessness that we're really trying to make sure that we're catching people that are within two weeks going to need emergency shelter or will be literally homeless on the street and helping them come up with a solution that we might be able to come together, create a plan and keep them from having to experience homelessness. So we're really, really, really focusing on housing here, um, keeping as many young adults from having to enter the shelter system as possible. So homelessness in itself can be a trauma. And we all are very focused on being trauma informed and helping young individuals from having to experience that. Um, we know that trauma can affect a person's uh, mental and physical health and the experience of homelessness as time goes on, the longer the experience, the further the trauma and the deterioration of mental and physical health can happen. So we're focusing on the community partners that we work with, um, as my colleague Carl mentioned, the McKinney Vintos within the school system, um, our colleagues at DCF, our colleagues in the criminal justice system, all social service agencies across the state to really have this focus on helping youth to, to come up with a housing plan rather than focusing on trying to get them into shelter. So really housing focused. The reasons that we implement shelter diversion um, are vast and broad and very important. It improves our system outcomes by reducing entries into homelessness, which I alluded to the, the trauma that can be experienced in the homeless experience. Um, it improves the quality of life by helping people to avoid the stress of a shelter stay. And we'll talk a little bit about the misconceptions that people may have about the use of emergency shelter, um, in, especially during our um, current crisis, health crisis in the pandemic, we're really trying to keep um, shelter beds used only when it is a very last resort for somebody um, trying to keep folks out of congregate settings, especially during this time. Um, we're really, really focused on cutting down on shelter wait lists. We don't want to have a list of folks that are needing shelter that are um, either sleeping outdoors or in a place that's not meant for human habitation, um, really working with those folks to come up with other housing solutions rather than emergency shelter. And in recognizing that um, an emergency shelter is really only a temporary solution, uh, not a housing solution. Um, so if we can capture the housing solution before shelter is needed, um, we're gonna make every effort to do that. So we like to use this analogy um, in thinking about the initial front door of homelessness, the initial call to 211 and a phone conversation with a call specialist um, at the call center, um, further deeper conversations that are happening at the CAN appointments, initial CAN appointment and intake. And we really think of those two things at that front door of homelessness in the same way that we would think about somebody entering an emergency room um, front lobby where they're greeted and assessed quickly um, to see what their level of crisis is. So somebody that walks into an emergency room that has you know, a sprained ankle is gonna be treated very differently than somebody that enters an emergency room that has um, is experiencing a heart attack. And the level of services that are needed for those two people are very different. And we think about that in the same way in our homeless response system to say that the level of housing crisis can vary extremely um, from one person to the next. And we wanna make sure that if there's a light touch for that person who maybe has a sprained ankle, that that's the amount of um, services that are presented and, and um, helped out with their, their housing crisis to, to resolve it as quickly as possible. Whereas the person who is having a heart attack is gonna be immediately admitted into the emergency room and seen by a cardiologist as quickly as possible. So we think about um, for the imminent homeless piece, in the shelter diversion practice, if the, the client is presenting and stating that they have only one night to stay 
um, with a friend or family member. That's very different. And they're, you know, calling uh, friends and acquaintances even um, on a daily basis in a frantic pattern of trying to find somewhere to uh, have a roof over their head for the evening is very different than somebody who maybe has an aunt that has a spare room and they're allowed to stay there for up to a month. So we're really focusing on that initial triage, that initial, initial interview and conversation to provide the appropriate level of services um, that a client might need in order to maintain their housing. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. It should be coming That's on screen, okay. Sure. So shelter diversion as a practice is really the bottom line is that it's a problem solving conversation. It's a problem solving conversation that's rooted in strengths based um, practices. Um, those of you that maybe have had motivational interviewing can be a real great tool in this um, conversation. So you as the provider or the person doing the intake, your job is to listen to help them um, identify their strengths, identify their natural supports, um, and then provide some information and guidance. And the myth busting piece is really um, thinking about what the role of emergency shelter is, when it's needed, why it's needed, and why we wanna keep people from having to enter. The person in housing crisis who's speaking with you should really be focused on sharing their story, um, helping to create their own housing plan because if they have a stake in it and are able to come up with their own solutions, they're more likely to follow through. Um, they may have a lot of questions. Um, they may need help and guidance in taking what next steps are needed in order to secure and maintain permanent housing. But at the bottom of the bottom line of the, the problem solving conversation is really making sure that every single person that touches our homeless response system is treated and seen as a person first and treated with dignity and respect. Um, really creating a safe space, creating that trust so that the youth feels comfortable in speaking with you, letting you know what their um, what their next steps might be and who their supports might be and really feeling comfortable and opening up to, uh, to work with you on that housing stabilization plan together. Next slide. It's coming, I'm sorry, for some reason it's very slow. Thanks, Amber. So the problem solving conversation really, here are some like example questions that you might wanna start by asking. Um, can you tell me why you're seeking emergency shelter today? What are the other things that you maybe have tried before you called 211 or thought about trying before you're you decided to seek out emergency shelter? Where have you been staying and how long have you been staying there? What are the reasons why you might not be able to stay there any longer? Um, are there additional reasons, other, other circumstances that are um, not permitting you to have a stable housing situation? So really looking at the, the housing history, um, if a client is really bouncing day to day or is very unstably housed, we wanna know um, where you're staying now, but where were you staying prior to that? Where's the last most stable place that you were able to, to stay? Um, are there referrals or services that we can provide to your natural supports, your friends or family that would um, allow you to stay even on a more temporary basis with those natural supports? If that's even up to a couple of weeks or a month, if we're able to, um, be very creative in our problem solving and our, our mediation with those friends and family. Um, how can we work things out in order to allow the youth a more permanent place to stay? So moving forward after that original conversation, that original intake with the client who's presented and needing help with housing, um, we really wanna make sure that we've listened, actively listened to the client, um, explored their past strengths, and then we want to make a plan to move forward. So what are the what are the other needs that the client has identified? Um, how can we work out a plan together so that they might be able to go back to live with friends or family? Uh, can they return to their own or their own residence? And oftentimes that is somebody that 
maybe is um, working with a landlord that has a, a unit of their own but is uh, maybe behind on rent and we need to help them with some mediation with their landlord. Uh, we may be working out a plan to temporarily divert as we seek new housing. And those cases may be that the friends or family would be more likely and more willing to assist uh, with a temporary housing solution if they knew that other steps were being um, put into motion in order to come up with a different solution. Um, often family or friends would be a little more likely to want to assist if they know that there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel and they know what steps the client is taking on their own in order to find a different housing solution. Um, another option for some youth um, is relocating to another safe permanent place outside of town with another natural support. So um, maybe a youth that doesn't have any income of their own but has family that wants to help, but they just can't get to them. So when we can verify that there's a natural support um, outside of town that could be in another state, um, if we can assist with you know, the, the transportation, whether that be a bus pass, um, helping with food insecurity for the trip, um, just making sure that we have a safe plan in place to get the youth to a natural support that might be able to help um, for, a, for a longer period of time. So these are just some of the diversion outcomes that happen often. They're not exclusively the only plans that we can put into place to help youth come up with stable housing. Um, but here are just a few of those, um, as we alluded to already, um, working with the, the client's natural supports for a temporary housing solution, um, returning to or getting their own new rental unit or residence. Uh, sometimes a sober home can be a temporary solution where they might be able to provide um, some minimal rental assistance for a sober home up to, uh, usually it's about three months that we can do that for. Um, shared housing can be another great solution, especially for those folks that are on the poverty level uh, that may be receiving state benefits um, that is not quite enough for them to maintain a rental of their own, but working on uh, finding a roommate maybe and coming up with um, some shared housing expectations um, right off the get-go to really help with uh, coming up with a stable housing solution. Uh, that brings us to the part of diversion that can provide some financial assistance and opening up the conversation to financial assistance oftentimes can really um, assist in, in creating that trust with somebody, creating that safe space to say, I know that you're in crisis, I know that you're in need and you need some services, but if there's a, that piece of a financial that we can help out with that can really go a long way in coming up with a better stable housing program. Um, so some of the emergency assistance that is um, available through CCH is our Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project that Roy is head of. Um, shelter diversion outside of the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project can offer some assistance in, um, again, security deposits, rental assistance, but we can really be creative in the financial uses of those uh, dollars. So it can be anything from, you know, an air mattress, to helping a family uh, natural support with um, you know, gift cards to help them fill their fridge with food. Uh, we can really be creative in the use of those funds. Um, again, along the same lines as use, uh, creative uses for shelter diversion, we think about rapid exit in the same way in that we wanna rapidly exit any youth that is currently already experiencing homelessness, whether that's um, literal homelessness on the street or if they've had to enter shelter, um, we can still provide some of that financial assistance to really make sure that their experience of homelessness is as short as possible to get them into stable housing quickly. So in order to access any financial assistance through CCH under any of those programs that I just mentioned, um, your provider agency must have a signed MOU with CCH. The staff that is working with the client and looking to um, submit requests for financial assistance for those clients must have attended a CCH diversion training. We do have some of those recorded webinars available on our website. We also have um, two diversion trainings that are coming up within the next month or so. I'm sure that we can have Amber send out the information on those um, following this webinar. 
um, your agency and staff also need to have access to HMIS, which is our homeless management system database, um, so that you can view client records and um, submit data as you are working with, with your client. So again, we really try to think outside the box and there, there's a sample list here of allowable expenses that we can help, um, help youth out with in order to assist them with coming up with a stable housing plan as quickly as possible. Very often the need is for security deposit um, and rental assistance in order to get those upfront costs of getting someone into a, a rental unit of their own. Um, for youth that is um, newly employed or on benefits and has a minimal income, um, taking the time to save up a security deposit in that first month's rent can really be a barrier uh, for them to get into their own housing quickly. Uh, so a majority of requests that we see do, um, do reflect this, this need for security deposit and rental assistance. But again, we're really focusing on that real creative problem solving conversation. And when we can identify other costs that are directly housing related, those might be um, utility deposits and startup costs. It could be application fees for rentals. It can be anything from moving expenses. Um, we've got a really exciting grant that we received this year from PetSmart. So if there's a barrier that a youth is experiencing because they have a pet that uh, landlords maybe ask for a separate security deposit because of the pet or if there's other expenses and we need to maybe kennel a pet for a short period of time while we get the youth into stable housing. So those are allowable expenses as well. Um, anything from childcare costs to past medical dues, transportation, as long as the associated cost is directly um, related to the housing plan, then those can be allowable expenses. Um, if your provider already has an MOU, if you're working with clients and you're looking for you know, creative solutions and you have questions about whether or not allowable costs um, the, the, uh, the need that you've identified, if you want to find out if it's an allowable cost, um, we're always available to answer those questions. Great. Thanks so much, Diana. Welcome. Uh, as this um, webinar is called Working with Youth, I just want to spend some time talking about housing first and best practices for actually working with youth. Now, of course, we cannot um, have any program or really do anything without covering housing first. That should always be kind of a, at the forefront, you know, kind of guide us on our way. So housing first is the belief that housing is a basic necessity that must be prioritized before an individual can pursue other personal goals and work towards improving their quality of life. Oftentimes, we hear people say that you know, someone may not be, they're not ready for housing, right? They don't have a job. They're not taking their medication. They won't see their, um, their clinician. They're not ready to be housed yet. But really, as you see from this graph right here, housing readiness is not a real thing. It, it doesn't work. Um, housing is a basic need. Think about Haslaw's hierarchy of needs. That's the foundation. You have to first house someone cover that basic need, and then you can work on some other things. So let's take someone, let's house them, and then once they have that and they feel a little um, safe and comfortable, then we can work on their, their medical, their mental health, their income, you know, show them how to be a, a good tenant and anything else that follows. So I just want to emphasize housing first. Everything comes from that housing first perspective. All right, I have a lag. Um, so we often say we want to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. We think we can do that within three steps. So step one is making homelessness rare. What does that consist of? That consists of having housing plans begin at intake right from the beginning. There's no need to wait until someone is, is housed or further along the, um, in the process. You want to help them to create that vision and set those goals from the very beginning so that you can actively work with them on that. 
Also, step two is making homelessness brief, right? And we do that by having active listening, um, being empathetic, really having some client-led problem solving. This goes into really truly working with the individual, really building that rapport with them, really focusing on maybe some MI practices, but really truly working with the individual, right? And then step three is making homelessness non-recurring. And we do this by highlighting their strengths. We want to refer them to state and local agencies. You want to connect them to employment, education, mental health, and any other supports so that they have a full network. So outside of you as a provider, outside of being in a program, when that time is up, they have a network. They know who to contact. They know, you know what services that they may, may need or what supports they may need and who to contact. So all of this is to say our, our main goals is, as we said tons of times during this training, we want to focus on solving the housing crisis. We want to start there. We don't want to just put someone in a program um, or enter them in a shelter. Really see if you can solve the housing crisis. Also support and help them on a path for housing stability. Um, help them resolve any type of issues that may um, impede on accessing their housing. So if they don't have identification, if they don't have a social network, if they don't have um, any you know, benefits or any access to food or clothing, they don't have a completed application, anything that may affect them having access to housing, that should be a focus. Also connecting to community resources and services, as I mentioned earlier, and practice self-sufficiency. Get them to a point where they can rely on themselves. You know, focus on skill building, really teaching them some skills and show them how to be self-sufficient so that they, they can um, be independent outside of a program or service. Okay, so we're gonna focus on several different elements that we often um, cover, which is uh, being client-driven, being strengths-based, trauma-informed, and housing-focused. So client-driven is the client directs the, really the, all of it. <laughs> the client directs when, where, and how often case managed meetings occur. You know, this is their service, right? They're, received, they're in a driving seat. Our job is to be a support kind of guide them in the right direction, maybe being that backseat driver and saying, okay, well, maybe you should think about this or do this, but really they, they drive it and we have to support them. So your housing plan should be written in first person because it's in their own words, as Diana said, they have to believe what it is that's on those plans. If they don't believe it, they're not going to do it. Um, you want to be available. You want to allow the families the space to test and problem solve, especially with landlords. You want to be there to support any challenges that may come about and take advantage of any teachable moments. And you want to prepare them to be good tenants once they get to that place of, of being housed. Next, we have strength-based. So help them identify their own strengths and successes and their past that can help them with their current crisis. Something has worked for them before. Figure out what has worked for them before. Um, and then support and trust that people want to succeed. They want to be successful. They may not be able to um, articulate it. They may not be able to really put it in words and show that they have that drive, but trust that it's there and act as, as though they truly do. And just always be a positive encouragement for them. That's really important. We should be their, their cheerleaders, really. The screen is messed up. And last is trauma-informed. So we want to emphasize the emotional and physical safety. We want to develop the rapport, establish trust, um, it's hard, you know, going through the that process and opening up and answering some of those difficult questions. So establish the trust, show them that you can, um, you're there for them to support them. 
You want to help them rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. Let them know that this is their um, this is their life. You know, they have control and they they can get through these difficult times. And you want to minimize any chance of re-traumatizing. We know that a good amount of youth that experience homelessness, some of it comes from trauma. So if they are open to sharing what type of trauma that is, be very, very careful so that you're not re-traumatizing them, that you're not exposing them to any future trauma that may arise. And then lastly is being housing focused. We don't just want to house someone. Our goal is to keep someone housed, right? So we want to focus on housing stabilization every step of the way. We want them to really own the plan um, and utilize the different community supports and resources that they may have, but always stay housing focused, figure out what problems may come up and how can we fix them so that they can stay housed. That is our main goal. And with that being said, it's also housing retention focus, not just staying, getting housed, but staying housed. So once someone is actually housed, you know, the goal should be focused on compliance with the lease and how they can pay their rent to maintain their housing. Have them start thinking about that from the very, very beginning. Yes, they may have assist financial assistance now, but it may not happen. Um, you know, forever. So how can they continue to pay their rent? How can they um, be compliant with their lease and make sure that they are, are staying housed? Also, the housing plan should be SMART goals. SMART meaning specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited. Spell it out completely, you know, so that they can clearly see what their goals are and what it consists of. Focus on short-term goals, so that is something um, that they can attain instead of such a large goal that may be really difficult to focus on and achieve, and then they end up feeling overwhelmed and, you know, it's too hard of a stretch, but short-term goals. And also update the plan regularly. It's not something that is only done, you know, at intake or when someone first comes in. It can be updated at any time there's any change. And it, the intensity may increase if necessary. Some individuals may need a, a lot of services and some individuals may not. It depends on what's going on with their life. But these are just some, some basic practice and things to keep in mind as you're really working with the youth so that you can um, be as successful as, as possible with building that rapport and really just trying to work with them on their goals. Now, I believe, I'm going to hand it over to Roy to talk about impact of conflict and crisis. Thank you, Amber. And welcome again, everyone. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, conflict, crisis, um, mainly within the home, and especially with, um, with young people. Uh, we know that family conflict is uh, came up on a slide previously is one of the reasons, if not the major reason, for for why um, a lot of young people uh, leave the home or maybe asked to leave the home. And it's uh, especially when uh, when asked to leave the home is is very traumatizing, or there's trauma, you know, actually happening during this time of when they're asked to leave or when they leave on their own. And uh, could be really demoralizing, um, can have a young person to uh, lose or can impede the ability to have confidence, um, to even think about their own goals that they may have for themselves. Um, they lose the ability to advocate for themselves. Uh, you've heard the providers before speak about how um, when young people come in, how traumatized they are, stressed they are, the anxiety, uh, the crisis level, where they may have lost that ability to be able to advocate for themselves. So uh, the providers, you know, do their best to advocate for that young person um, while they're in this uh, traumatized and crisis state until they are able to, to uh, find those strengths within themselves to be able to um, advocate for themselves and take back that control and then be able to have positive interactions 
with their peers and with adults. If they're coming from a household, you know, the, the adults are the ones who are who are ruling ruling the roost, right? So uh, it's hard to think after leaving that household that they can have a positive interaction with an adult. So a lot of times when they come, when they uh, arrive and they're in front of you and you build that the relationship, you may be that one of few positive adults in their life at that time. So because of everything that has happened in their uh, residence that they um, have been asked to leave or they left willingly from. So just to keep all of that in mind, what conflict um, can do to a young person. <clears throat> so family conflict. And we work, uh, we have a model that uh, UCLA um, actually created called Strive, Strive Mediation. Uh, it's the support to reunite and involve each other. Uh, one of the authors, actually the main author and researcher was, uh, her name is Dr. Noita Milborn. Milborn. I uh, actually had the opportunity to meet her at a conference in San Diego a couple years ago. Uh, and, and this model, I've used it. I'm a Strive trainer. Um, so I've been trained and now I'm a trainer as well. And we're going to be training um, providers across the state. Uh, there is a full two-day Strive training. That's how in-depth uh, it is. Uh, and as you can see here, almost 90% of runaway youth in shelters and 75% in residential programs remote, reported family dynamics as critical issues leading to their homelessness. And the CLA created this because they started doing research on young people who ran away and run away from them because a lot of times that's how the homelessness starts, right? They run away for a couple of days, go stay with a friend, they come back home. They leave again to go stay with a family member they come back home. Eventually, those stays away from home become longer, and then they start the bouncing around and house hopping, couch surfing, which could then eventually lead, once you run out of resources and options, could lead to a young person being literally homeless. So their, their research, research showed that if you could get in, if you could get the mediation started with whoever the head of the household is, parents, guardian, um, you know, another relative, an old, you know, an older brother, whoever the head of the household is, a sister, that if you can get in there after the first or second time they run away, you can resolve the issue so that they do not run away again, which can lead to homelessness. And they went even deeper with the research that showed that the running away and once the, uh, the house hopping and bouncing around starts, the survival skills get a lot more riskier. And then the survival skills get riskier, the risk of um, sexual STD, sexually transmitted diseases goes up, the risk of substance abuse goes up, the risk of mental uh, uh, abuse goes up. So they developed this model to be able to get the family at the table to be able to discuss um, and hopefully resolve their issues. <clears throat> and it, it consists of five sessions. They can be an hour long. That's what's suggested, depending on your capacity, depending on the uh, family's capacity. Uh, it, it's up to you. It, it, it's up to you to be able to be flexible. You know, families work and you determine where these sessions can happen. They can happen in the family's home if you feel safe. Do not go anywhere where you do not feel safe. It can happen at a Dunkin' Donuts once you know these places open up again, um, or they can happen in your your office or your agency as long as there's privacy and you're able. People, folk, people uh, are asked to sp can speak freely. And you can see some of the benefits here that you're looking for, what the model aims at, improving relation, rela uh, family relationships. And it does that by uh, you know, increasing emotional reg regulation. You know, they're coming into, <clears throat> there's a lot of emotions uh, going on. They're coming into these sessions 
with high emotions. Uh, you know, when they come in, they come in because they're angry. So it's up to you to try to, you know, create a positive atmosphere when you're conducting these sessions and try to find a positive level of equilibrium between both parties. Uh, you want to enhance communication skills. We all know whenever there's conflict, whenever there's uh, arguments uh, with all of our relationships, the communication breaks down and no one's listening to each other at that point. And in fact, people are saying stuff deliberately to um, hurt the other person. So enhancing those communication skills so folks can really speak to each other to really get into get into the get to the point of what is happening, why, why is this conflict happening, what is going on, and how can we resolve it? And they will learn all of that through the activities. There's activities that you go through without throughout these sessions. There's role playing. A lot of times folks don't, you know, people don't even hear how they sound like until the role playing is role play is done. And then it's like, oh, I, I sound like that. Like, oh, I, I, you know, and then a lot of it will be like, oh, I, I didn't realize that I sounded like that or I came off like that. And then you have different roles. What somebody, somebody in the home could be a, the martyr. The other person in the home could be the tyrant, you know, and there's different roles that people play within a household and they don't even realize it. So throughout these activities, they, they're doing the work throughout these activities and they figure out how these roles are defined and then they see where and how conflicts happen and then you're assisting them with working through these through these conflicts. Uh, improving conflict resolution skills, how to talk through things and communicate things and increasing establishment of boundaries and consistencies within those boundaries. You know, if you're, you know, a lot of, a lot of times uh, both parties will set boundaries but not be consistent with them and then the area the lines are blurred and then that's gray area there and then again then the next time you want to enforce it but yet you've already let the line be crossed so many times that it's so blurred and now you get both parties getting angry because the boundaries were not consistent so you work on that and i just put that note there at the bottom because you are not licensed um, therapists, licensed counselors, although some of you may be, I'm not. So I just want to say that STRIVE does not replace family counseling should the family decide that they've done the STRIVE and it's work, but they want to go a little deeper because they've discovered something more about themselves or the younger party or both. Uh, then they want to go to family counseling by all means. You assist them with that uh you know or a therapist because again there's some other uh, uh challenges that have come up during the sessions that may require some some deeper um clinical assistance so client empowerment and 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 ownership uh you make someone you know once people feel like they've been heard and the, you know, we've all had our conflicts and arguments, and then once you're able to resolve it, both parties can come out feeling more confident and, you know, feel like, okay, well, I was heard. Like, I, my rights, uh, like, I do matter. Like, I do have value. You listen to me. Uh, we came to a resolution that benefits both of us. So I am being heard. I'm 16 years old. I'm 17 years old. I'm 18. And you know what? You say, come home at 10, I want to stay out till one. Wow, we negotiated that it's midnight or whatever. So yes, I get to stay out later and you still get to, you know, I'm home still at a decent time that's comfortable comfortable to you. So you feel more, you so you feel like, okay, well, I was hurt and I do have some rights here. And you know, it works where you can make your own, you know, you can make your own decisions, but still work along uh, with that with that person. And uh, if you're doing this uh, with a client during a session, you can also, you know, wor you're working alongside that client anyway, and that client then becomes a partner in, the, in their journey of establishing um, housing and getting services and resources. So you're not dictating 
to them what they should be doing, but you're a partner with them on the journey of them getting their lives uh, back together to where they're where they were because clients were they were happy at one time before they came to you, getting them back to them that place of confidence and happiness. Thank you, Roy. So right along with there we go. Right along with um, client empowerment and ownership, you know, we also have motivational interviewing where I can't stress enough how important MI is for working with youth. Um, but basically, motivational interviewing is a person-centered technique for strengthening an individual's own motivation and commitment to change. We all been there, you know, in our teens or early 20s or so, and you really think that um, you like you know. <laughs> right, maybe very, very headstrong, and you really think that you know. And working with youth can be really, really difficult, but using practices such as MI, it's a way of having a guided type of communication to really get them to the point where they realize for themselves that they they should make some positive changes, you know, that they they want to make a change within themselves. It's not because as a adult or a provider, we said that they should take their medication or they should um, get employment, but it's a way of getting them to realize that I want to do this for myself and I see the importance of it and I want to do this. So it's really about change talk and it's a, it's a technique to really motivate someone. Um, but not just us motivating them, but them motivating themselves. So there's some key skills that um, goes along with MI. One of the first ones is open-ended questions. So not just asking them a question where you will get a no or yes response. You know, with, with a, um, young adults, they may not want to talk all the time. It may just be a, a yes or no, but you want to ask the open-ended questions to get them to talk a little bit more to have more conversation, to have more dialogue with them. Also, affirmations, you know, provide some positive comments. They need that reinforcement, provide some positive comments for them. And also reflection. Say, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, you know, and rephrase for them so that they can hear what it is that, that they're saying. And maybe after hearing it, they'll realize, okay, that's not really what I what I mean, or maybe that's not how I want to come off. So rephrasing um, is really important so that they can truly hear what they're what they're saying and really think about it. And also summaries, you know, summing up key points of the conversation at the end of the conversation, say, okay, so we talked about this, this, and this. And is 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 that how it went? Is that how the conversation went for you? And also solicit change talk, you know, ask questions about the desired change. How, what is the life you, you see for yourself? You know, how do you want your day-to-day -day life to be? What type of job is it that you want to have? Instead of just asking, do you want a job? Um, but really asking those questions so that you can see what it is that they desire for themselves. So as I said, um, MI is amazing. It's amazing for working with everyone, but especially with youth. Um, and we will be having some motivational interviewing uh, trainings coming up. Actually, I believe I have an advanced MI training on March 16th and March 19th. That's advanced. So it's for someone that has previously taken a motivational interviewing training, or at least knows about the concept. Um, and that's just going to practice on more, more practice work for furthering, you know, how to do the skills. But there will be additional intro to motivational interviewing. I will send the information out. You can also access it on our training calendar. And lastly, because I know we're running short on time, just want to talk about community connections. As we've already said, it's really important to connect the individual to as many um, support systems as possible. You know, provide them with some independent problem solving skills and resources outside of the program so that they can build up those skills themselves and know how to do things independently. 
and also connect them to mainstream and community-based organizations that will continue to assist them after services have ended. So something outside of you, something that they can um, access on their own and they are not as reliant on the program. And then as Rachel mentioned earlier, we have some additional resources, but here are just some examples of other community connections, you know, connecting someone to employment, utility assistance, food assistance, churches, um, legal assistance, transportation, um, identification I know is really, really difficult, any substance treatment, um, SSI if they qualify, but there are so many resources out there and it's really important to assist someone with building a, a network but outside of just the resources, you also want to connect them to other services that may be beneficial as far as developmental, if they maybe have some developmental disabilities or um, LGBTQ services, or if they experience domestic violence, including sex trafficking or sexual assault. Um, if they were previously a veteran, if there's legal aids and the list goes on and on, we have a lot of different resources on our website as well as other websites as you see, but it's really important to connect to resources to help them build their network and provide as much assistance and support as possible. And if there's something that you don't know, if you don't know of a resource that's out there, always connect them to 211. We often think of 211 as being the, you know, the place where you call just if you need housing, but they have so many resources on their website, as well as if you call, um, as far as food or clothing or mental health or any type of service you can think of, two-on-one is a great resource. We covered so many different things during this training today, um, but this was really just, just the beginning. We still have that other part of the homeless response system um, graph that we showed you at the beginning that we need to cover, but we just wanted to focus on the beginning phases and really, really working with someone before we go into more detail about different programs and, and all of that. But at this point, we're gonna open it up for any questions that you may have. Please feel free to enter, enter that in the questions box and I'm gonna start going through questions. So, before we go into it, and I, I missed too much time, let me just thank all of the, the many different panelists that we had today. Um, if you guys can come back on, turn your cameras back on so we can answer these questions. One question that, oh, we have several questions, actually, I'm sorry. We have several. So one question, and I think, Diana, you will be the best to answer. What is an MOU? Thank you. We forget that we often speak in acronyms within our homeless response system, so it's a great question. Uh, MOU stands for Memorandum of Understanding. It's basically a contract between the provider agency and CCEH that outlines um, how you can request financial assistance, um, what documentation is required for the provider agency as well as CCEH. Uh, so that would be signed by your executive director. Okay, thank you. And let's see. And if you can just do one more time, how do they go about applying for these funds? Yeah, once an MOU has been signed, um, the provider agency is given the um, access to either um, HMIS, where you can put in a financial service request um, for your client, or for some of the other financial assistance programs that we run, we have a Smartsheet online request form that we use. Um, and so again, once your agency has signed an MOU, you would be given access to those request um, options to, to request financial assistance. Great, thank you. And if a youth does not have identification, is there anything that we can do to assist them with that? Is there anywhere that they can go, say if they're, they're homeless and they have no IDs, what can they do? So yeah, they're connecting with us as the navigators. We can help them, you know, if they need the, the funds to do it, if they need help making an appointment. Um, I know, you know, if we do have youth that enter into the shelter, the shelter is really good about getting those for them. It does sometimes get challenging because obviously sometimes you need your birth certificate or your um, social security card to get your ID and you need both of those to get your social security cards so kind of figuring out where they're at but there are different ways we can go about assisting them with getting that 
Great, thank you. Um, on, is there any type of average how long it takes from an individual to come into the system um, before they're housed? I think it's very situational. Um, obviously, you know, it is housing first. So, I mean, we try and get people as quickly as we can. I think with everything with COVID, it's been a whole different world of what it used to be and trying to find landlords that are willing to take people, even if they don't have income, um, those sort of things, even though they know they're working with us. I mean, we try and help people as quickly as we can, help them get things as quickly as they can. So if they don't have employment, if it's the barrier of IDs, getting those IDs in place, you know, if they're looking for employment, there's different agencies we can refer them to. I know in the Northwest, um, our Waterbury Youth Services also has a labor agency that they work with. So we're able to help refer people there. You know, they work with them with developing a resume and interview skills and those sort of things. So, I mean, we do try and move people as quickly as we can, but it all depends, you know, where each person's at and we work with them where they're at to get them to where they want to be. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I can I can just follow up on that a little bit as well. Uh, thank you, Kaylin. That we do have our benchmarks and um, specific goals that we try to reach because we do not want folks to be either outside in their cars, literally homeless, or in shelter longer than they need to be. So we have a benchmark of 45 days or less. We like to get it to 30 days or less. Once people make that initial call, enter into the system and we get them securely housed. So, and that's with, you know, getting IDs and making referrals and everything like that. So what Kaylin and Glory do is truly phenomenal because that may sound like a long time, but when you're trying to get IDs and you're looking for landlords and you're getting leases signed and you're getting SSI and you're, you know, finding them a job, that 30 45 days goes pretty quickly so but that is the benchmark for the state of connecticut great thank you and for carl how would you say someone should go about making different connections for outreach you spoke about you know mckinney ventos and just other community providers what's the first step or is there a website or some type of information someone can follow to be connected so that's a great um, that's a great one. There is this varies region to region right now. The best thing that I would say is get in contact with us. I know that Greater Hartford has a standing outreach meeting. Um, Alexis Gaynor was on the phone with us this morning talking to youth providers statewide about this meeting. Um, there are more of these meetings taking place, and I think this is like a venue that if it, it if it exists locally in your can um that's like the most bang for your dollar so i would just the next question would be like what where are you from and then we'd take a, a closer look at who's doing outreach there how organized are they and then additionally there's a quarterly uh it could be a little bit more than quarterly but it's an at least a quarterly meeting statewide with demas and path providers that is chaired by brenda earl um and that's open, right? Those are path specific things, uh, folks who show up there. But again, that's a, a statewide meeting specifically for path providers. So uh, we can share these resources uh, with you offline and or with the group um, as a follow up. Great. Thank you. Um, another question came through with just expression the, the frustration that some youth have with calling 211 and many do not want to call 211 anymore. Do you all have any type of recommendations as far as how you can um, get a youth to call 211 or if there is any other way around it so that they can still get the support and the services that they need? All right, yes, absolutely. I'll, ch I'll chime in with that. Yeah, you know, that is, that is a re recurring theme that, you know, we've we've heard and we, two on one is a partner of, of CCEA. So we work with, with them uh, as well all the time on making it easier for folks to, uh, for young people to be able to call in what the expectations are 
and uh, what will be asked of them, uh, what we would suggest if they are having uh, um, some kind of difficulties when they do call into 211 is maybe have someone uh, call with them to um, be able to navigate uh, the system with them, especially if they're already working with an agency. Um, if they, you know, if there's someone within their community who they trust um, can call in uh, with them to be able to help navigate the system. Uh, two on one to be able to access the services is right now the 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 only doorway. However, a lot of times young people will get someone who will uh, just call in with them to provide that extra support while they're on the phone because it can be a little bit daunting and sometimes the wait times can be longer than what you might want them to be but if, if you have someone there with you for support um it'll, it'll be a, a lot easier and, and that person can also help you navigate through some of the questions that may be asked perfect all right our questions are are slowing down but i will ask maybe diana or roy um for the different funding and that's available is it only for for shelter divergence, someone coming in, or can it also be put into place for someone that is, say, currently housed, but they are just behind on their rent for several months and they're facing eviction? Yeah, for those folks that are possibly facing eviction, and we know that there's some gray area at the moment with the eviction moratorium still in place, um, we're still trying to prove that imminent homelessness. So if somebody is currently housed, but it's not stable, they might qualify for some diversion assistance if we can prove that imminent homelessness piece. Um, once a youth has entered shelter, they still qualify for the same level of assistance in rapid exit funding um, through YHTP. Um, and we can also provide still some diversion efforts if we have a plan in place prior to the youth entering shelter and we know that we have an end date that's gonna happen within a week or so. If, if we know the shelter stay is part of a broader diversion plan, we have to place the youth somewhere for up to a week, but we know that after that week, we have a move-in date with a natural support or we have a move-in date with a new unit, then the diversion assistance can still happen. Perfect, perfect. Actually, that looks like that is all of the questions that came through. Um, if there are any additional questions after this presentation, feel free to um, contact training at ccch.org. That will bring you to my um, email, but I will reach out to those if you would like information from Diana Roy or, or whoever we have a, a large group of people, but you can follow up at training at cch.org. Also, we do have the standard questions that are coming through as far as will the slides be available? Yes, they will. I will send the slide out and the recording as well. And they will also be available on our webinar library. If you go to our website, cceh.org, you can go to the resource tab and you'll see webinars and you'll have the, the slides and the recording will be there as well. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Rachel, Kaylin, Carl, Diana, Roy, Gloria, you're out there somewhere. Thank you all so much for um, joining us today. Thank you for you all joining us and take care. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.